You're listening to a sermon preached at Grace Church of Orange, California. For more info about Grace, please go to www.graceorange.org. And now, join us as we go verse by verse through God's inspired, inerrant, infallible Word. Good morning. Please open your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. Yes, Romans chapter 6. Today we're going to see a passage we've become very familiar with. Romans 6, 19 to 23. We will see what happens when a heart changes. What happens when a heart changes. Uh, The hope of every true believer in Jesus is one day heaven, right? Heaven. It's going to be awesome. Uh, We were... Talking about this in our home group last week, we're going to rejoice. We are going to have reunions. We are going to be resting in the Lord. There will be no stress. There will be no strife. There will be no struggle with sin. There's going to be no deadlines, no demands, no decisions, uh, no problems, no personal injuries, no pain. Isn't that going to be awesome? But until then, we, we suffer through this life. We, we suffer through this life And we experience joyful heart change in Christ as believers. So if you're able, I want to invite you to stand with me. I'm going to read Romans 6, 19 through 23. It's the word of God. It is powerful. And God uses it to change our hearts. Romans 6, beginning at verse 19. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations, For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And let's pray. Lord, you are awesome. You are are awesome. Your, Your word is sweet to our souls. And I pray, Lord, In this time today, you would lead us to worship you as we look at your word. Even as the psalmist said, we we bow down toward your holy temple and we give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Because you have exalted above all things your name and your word. I pray, Lord, that you would sensitize our hearts to enjoy the sweet gospel truths that we see in Romans 6. And we pray in in Jesus' name, amen. Go ahead and have a seat there. There are really some sweet, sweet gospel truths here at the end of Romans 6. This is why we're not going into Romans 7 yet. We'll get there. Let's just enjoy the view here in Romans 6. What happens when a heart changes? What happens... When God opens your heart to the gospel message and out of sheer grace and mercy, he he gives you new life. He takes hold of your life and he reorients you and he gives you a new identity. He changes your position spiritually and progressively conforms you to Christ. What we see is that things change when a heart changes in Christ. Things change. And it's not us trying really hard to be like Jesus. It's trusting God to make you more like Jesus. And in Romans 6, in these verses we look at today, 19 through 23, we see three monumental changes that God brings about. Three monumental changes. The first is freedom. Freedom, your prison changes. You were a slave to sin, and now you're a slave of God. You were chained to sin, and now you are chained to Christ forever. It's the best possible freedom. And growth, 
Freedom leads to growth. You progressively change. Sanctification versus shame over sin. And glory. The third monumental change is glory. Your, your perspective on life changes. We saw that last week. You're, you're, you're now living with an eternal perspective which puts life now into proper perspective. And so today we're going to look at all three of these monumental changes, but we're going to focus the most on the second one, the idea of growth in Christ, growth in God's grace. But let's look first at freedom. Freedom, the fact that your prison changes, that that you were a slave of sin, but in Christ you are a slave of God. Your chains fell off, but now you are chained beautifully to Christ forever. You have new life in Christ. You you have been set free from sin to serve God freely. You are united with him in his death and resurrection. You are to consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. And you are to continually present yourself to God as his servants. We are not to let sin reign in our lives. Romans 8.2 says, The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Freedom. Look at Romans 6, 17. I love the phrase, thanks be to God, that's found there. Here is God acting on our behalf. Thanks be to God, he did something for us. We were once slaves of sin. We have now become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which we were committed. God committed us to himself and to his word. Verse 18, we've been set free from sin. We are now slaves of God. Verse 19, slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Now, I don't even remember who said it, but a long time ago, someone said or wrote, you know, if you're speaking or you're writing, don't use a long word if you can use a shorter word. All right? Sanctification is a long word. But it's also a Bible word, and it's found twice in our passage today. In fact, it's the only two times that that exact word is seen in the book of Romans. I can boil it down to God at work in your life. <laughs> okay? Sanctification, though, it's a big word, and there's really not another great word for it unless you want to say change, unless you want to say growth in Christ. Verse 22 tells us that the fruit or the outcome of sanctification is eternal life. So you had no good fruit as a slave of sin. You were ashamed of your actions prior to Christ. Now we want to please God. Now we want to grow in Christ. We realize right away it's not immediate perfection. It's a process of heart change by Christ. It's a process. And it results in love for Jesus. We, We love him because he first loved us. And what happens is a believer humbly declares, God saved me. God saved me from the penalty of sin. I've been justified. That's Romans chapters 1 through 5. But the believer also humbly declares, God is saving me. God is saving me from the power of sin. That's sanctification. That's Romans chapters 6 through 8. And then the believer humbly declares, God will save me from the presence of sin when my salvation is complete. That's glorification. That's Romans chapter 8. But we have this beautiful freedom. God has put us in the realm of freedom, and it's the best freedom ever, and it's that you're a slave of God. Doesn't that sound weird? The best freedom ever? The best prison to be in is is to be a slave of God, chained to Christ forever? And it leads to growth. It leads to growth in grace, to progressive change, uh, where we are becoming more and more like Christ versus living in sinful shame. So last week, we, I was mentioning that one writer put it this way, eternal life is the life of God in the soul of man. The life of God in the soul of man. So if you're a believer and you have eternal life, then God's life is in your soul. So what's sanctification? The process of that eternal life, what is that? It's the process of growing into eternal life where you're anchored in gospel truth. John Owen said it this way. He wrote a discourse concerning the Holy Spirit, and he said this, holiness or sanctification is the implanting, the writing, and the realizing of the gospel in our souls. God implants the gospel in your soul so that you would would know it and you would live it 
in your daily life experience in a very real way. And eternal life assumes change and growth. It's not static. It's growing and progressing and moving more Godward. It's God restoring his image in us. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says we have this treasure, this gospel treasure in jars of clay so that the surpassing power would be seen to belong to God and not to us. We can't grow ourselves in Christ. I mentioned that the end of Romans is the only time in Romans that the word sanctification is found. Once each in verse 19 and verse 22. Now the word sanctified is seen in Romans 15, 16. Uh, it refers to the Gentile believers set apart by the Holy Spirit. But that's it in Romans, okay? But you've got the word sanctification only twice, right here in verse 19 and right here in verse 22. Now, it can be translated holiness. In fact, it is translated in some Bible translations, holiness. So instead of, like look at verse 19, instead of saying that it leads to to sanctification, it would say it leads to holiness. The idea is purification. That's the whole idea of it. Purification. The state of purity after you've been purified by a purifier. Okay? So like you're on a, you're on a hike, you're on a camp out or something, you're on a backpack, let's say, and you bring your water purifier and you're like, I'm going to purify this, you know, Rancid pond water or something, and, and you're able to put it through there and just drink it, okay? What, what this is, is that God is the purifier, and he is continually purifying. He is sanctifying. He is making believers holy. He is making them more like Christ. Now, we don't walk in here today and say, you know, I feel a lot like Jesus today. And you should notice this, okay? You should notice how how much I'm like Jesus. This is not the way we are to live if we're to live humbly in Christ. Most of us are more like this, like, I don't feel so holy today. <laughs> I'm not sure if this process is even, is even in, in process anymore in me. But God is the purifier. And sanctification, growth in holiness, is a lifelong process that God orchestrates while you participate. Okay, God orchestrates this lifelong process while you participate, and it won't be complete until you're glorified when you see Jesus. And if you wonder, so, so where in the Bible is this process kind of, you know, explained? I'll make it easy on you. You turn to Romans chapter 7, after you've read Romans chapters 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, and then you read Romans 7 and 8 and 9 and 10 and 11 and 12 and 13, 14, 15, and 16. And then you read the whole rest of the New Testament. And there you have it. Sanctification, the process, the lifelong process. It's a progressive work of God with your willing engagement where you grow more free from sin and more dependent on God. Now again, we're like, whoa, whoa, I don't know how free from sin I am right this moment but I know I'm dependent on God. Sanctification is a process of putting off and putting on. Ephesians 4, 22 and through 24 speaks of this. It talks about how we were taught in Christ and to put off our old self, which belongs to our former manner of life, uh, corrupt through deceitful desires and all that, and then be renewed in the spirit of our minds, put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, sanctification, you might want to write this down, but sanctification is, is kind of three things, okay? There's three parts to it, all right? First, first, it's positional, okay? So you were sanctified in Christ. That's your spiritual position given to you at spiritual birth. When you came to faith in Christ, you were uh, sanctified in Christ. So it's positional, Secondly, it is progressive, this is what we're talking about here, this daily process of being conformed to the image of Christ, becoming who we are in Christ, what we are in Christ. It's growing up, okay, maturing in Christ. And sanctification is also, third, ultimate. There's an ultimate sanctification where, you, where, where it's when you are in God's presence, okay? And 
1 John 3, 2 speaks of this. Beloved, now we are children of God. And it has not appeared yet what we shall be. We know, though, when he appears, we shall be like him. Okay, we shall see him just as he is. Uh, Final sanctification. And sanctification flows out of justification. Okay, so when you're made right with God, justification, now God grows you. Sanctification. And one day, glorification, okay? And uh, that will be when you go to be with Jesus or when Christ returns, whichever comes first. But the idea, biblically, is that all these things are in process and God is doing all these things. And the idea is that whoever God justifies, he also sanctifies. And you can put it this way. Justification is an act of God's grace. A once-for-all event declares you right with him by faith in Christ. Sanctification is a work of grace. It is an ongoing project. Okay, so one is an event, justification. One is a project. Now, you probably all have projects in the garage or in some place in your house, and you've been working on this project, and you maybe left it there, and it's got dust all over it, right? Some of you need to get working on your projects, right? Well, you are God's project for your whole life, and, and God is at work in you to make you the kind of person he wants you to be. Now, we need some help here from Obadiah Sedgwick. Isn't that a cool name, Obadiah Sedgwick? Puritan preacher, lived from 1600 to 1658, and he wrote a book, he wrote a bunch of books, but one of the books he wrote, you're going to love this title if you love his name, The Bowels of Tender Mercy. Well, wait, there's more. The Bowels of Tender Mercy Sealed in the Everlasting Covenant. I love that title. The Bowels of Tender Mercy Sealed in the Everlasting Covenant. Obadiah Sedgwick wrote this, and in this book, he speaks of the relationship between justification and sanctification. And he makes some really good points, and here's what he says. And I kind of... Massage the words a little bit. Okay. He says, justification is a change from death and wrath to life and love. He says, sanctification is a change of heart. What happens when a heart changes? The unholy is made holy. He says, justification delivers us from the guilt and condemnation of sin. He says, sanctification delivers us from the filth of sin and the dominion of sin. He says, in justification, Christ's perfect righteousness is given to us. In sanctification, our imperfect righteousness is developed. He also makes this point, and it's a great point, all believers are justified alike. There's like one kind of justification. There's one flavor of justification. I am not more justified than you. You are not more justified than me. We are all justified alike, but we are not all sanctified alike. Some of you are progressing in sanctification more than others. Don't let that be a source of your pride, because if you're thinking, I'm probably that person, you're probably not, okay? So sanctification in Romans 6, 19 and 22 points to progressive growth in holiness because God put you into the position of sanctification via justification, where we actively yield to the Spirit of God in ongoing transformation. God changed us, so we pursue ongoing change. This is the idea of sanctification, where you will, you will to do God's will. You want God's will. You yield your will to God in ongoing dependence and obedience, and he changes you by his spirit, through his word, according to his will for his glory. That God actually inspires that pursuit in you. That God actually enables you to do what he wills. You want some proof? Look at Philippians chapter 2. Just turn there real quick. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. I want you to notice, you see God doing something, and you see us being called to do something as well. So Philippians 2, 
Verse 12, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's a comma there. Work it out. Work out your, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So God... Uh, gives us new life, he regenerates us, he changes our heart, and now we want what he wants. We actively obey, and, and here's what happens. When you actively obey, more change occurs. You progressively grow into your already declared position. So obedience leads to righteousness, conforming to God's will. Leads to sanctification, conforming to God's nature. Leads to eternal life, conform to God's life. And here's how God does it. This should blow our minds. God, by his grace, according to his plan, changes us by using broken vessels, broken things that seem useless even to us, even broken things that were destined for destruction, and he transforms us into something beautiful. Into something beautiful. It's kind of interesting. You, you might look in the mirror sometimes. I hate to make you feel bad, but you might look in the mirror sometimes and go, I don't know if I'm becoming more beautiful or not. <laughs> but when God looks at you and he sees your soul... He says, I'm making this person more beautiful. It has nothing to do with the mirror that you look in each day. It has to do with God changing our heart. I want to talk with you about changing by grace. In fact, I made up this little card, and my daughter Ariana drew it out, and, and we've got copies for anyone who wants them after the service. But I want to give you seven actions that we need to take by God's grace if we want to grow in grace. Now, I remember back when I was a brand new believer. I remember I, I knew I was changed. I knew I had new life in Christ. But I also knew it was going to take time for people to see that change. The other thing we need to know is it takes a whole lifetime to grow into the change that God put you into. So here are some things we should do by God's strength. The Bible tells us we are sanctified by God, but we also pursue it. Uh, Hebrews 12, 14. Pursue holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So here are seven actions to take by God's grace. First one is, first one is number one, take it in. Take the word of God in. Word of God. Ezekiel 3, 1 says, eat this book. Okay? Just, just eat this book. All right? Don't. Don't take me literally here, but take this book literally, okay? So take it in. Um, God's word, life change comes by God's spirit through his word heard and observed. Okay, so read it, hear it, do it. The word matters. It's the main course, not a side dish. He has spoken. His word, if he, uh, Hebrews 4.12 tells us, is living. It is active. It is it is piercing of hearts. It is judging thoughts and emotions and motives. God's Spirit uses God's word for God's glory. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Now, you don't need a big stack of Bibles. You just need one really, really well-used Bible. You need a, a well-known a well Bible. You, you, I don't, it doesn't matter if it's in paper or electronic. You need to know the Word of God. So you don't need a big stack of Bibles. You need one well-used one. Take it in. God's Word. Number two, another action you should take is talk it out. Talk it out by prayer. Prayer matters. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray without Ceasing, pray unceasingly, pray all the time. Colossians 4.2 says, be devoted to prayer. Be devoted to prayer. Like, pour out your heart to God. Align with God's will. Don't ask with wrong motives that you can spend them on your desires. Offer yourself to God in prayer. Number three, write it out. Write it out. What, what do I mean by that? Um, write down your thoughts. Journal. I've been keeping a journal for many years, and I've got a shelf full of journals, and now I 
pretty much write them electronically, but this is a heart-based thing where you, it, it's like the Psalms, okay? Pick any Psalm. I want someone to open up their Bible and pick a Psalm and tell me which one you just picked. Just pick any one. Hmm? Psalm 27, go to Psalm 27, okay? We did not set this up. I hope that my point gets made. <laughs> if not, we'll make the point the Bible says. No, here it, here it is, okay. Psalm 27, O Lord, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? So he's fearing, he's talking about being afraid. This is David who wrote this. The Lord is my stronghold of my life, of, of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. So there's evildoers, some problems here, right? Some problems. See, in the Psalms, David is usually starting by singing the blues. Do you like the blues? It kind of depresses you a little bit, right? So I love the blues. I love you know, bluegrass and all that too. But, but here's the thing. David is singing the blues, and he's saying, this is how bad it is. But what you find is you go through the Psalms, and you get to the end of a Psalm, and he's on a mountaintop. He starts in the valley, and he ends on a mountaintop. Let's see what Psalms 27 says. Oh, verse 13, I believe that I should look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. And here is David under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit pouring his heart, his honest heart out to God as God changes his heart. Starts in the depths, ends on the heights. Uh, and I would just say this. Find a way, find a way to express your heart to God. Maybe writing, singing, Again, maybe it's just in prayer, but express your wounds and your desires and your requests and your praises all through the process. Kind of chronicle the process. And I would venture to say that the more you do that, the less trouble you make with other people. Because number four is this, work it out. Work what out? Relationships. Relationships. Um, if you have trouble with relationships, you know, this is today is Mother's Day and you're like, Oh, I got some bad relationships. Oh, and it's Mother's Day, so I'll be happy today, but not inside. Just on the outside. Well, if you have trouble with relationships, read Ephesians 4, the whole chapter. If you have relationship problems, read Romans chapter 12, the whole chapter. Read 1 Corinthians 13. Have at it. Love keeps no record of wrongs. So that speck in your brother's eye that Jesus was talking about? And boy, do our, does our vision get really good when our brother has the speck. But you got to take care of the telephone pole in yours first. You want to grow in grace? Well, the proof of God's life in your soul is the fruit of the Spirit. You don't pick one of these nine things and say, I'm going to work on this this week. I'm going to work on patience. You don't know what you're talking about. No, no, no. God works on you. God is bringing, putting patience into your life. God grows love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in you and through you as you yield to him, not as you pick one out to work on. And what happens is, as you're working it out in relationship with other people, God grants repentance, God grants a desire to reconcile and to restore relationships, and that you would choose to walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And what a testimony of God's grace. When brothers and sisters in Christ uh, choose to overlook offenses, they forbear. When they forgive and they link arms in life and ministry and they say, life's too short for this. I want to live with a clear conscience before God and man. I want to be at peace. And the reason why is because we need each other in the body of Christ. But we need each other deeply and, and desperately. Number five, another action you should take in, by God's grace, reach out. Reach out with the gospel. Preach the word. Be ready. I think of Lydia in Acts chapter 16. It says that God opened her heart to believe the message, the gospel message. So you give it out, God uses it. Just the other day, I heard a little boy ask his dad, Daddy, what do you think Maddie's first sentence is going to be? I don't even know these people, and I'm just walking by them, and I hear them say this. Daddy, what do you think Maddie's first sentence is going to be? Isn't that sweet? It's like, what's my little sister's first sentence going to be? 
And it immediately made me think of the Apostle Paul. When he got saved, what was his first words? You know, it was a joyful noise, right? Who are you, Lord? Well, he was terrified. But then it tells us that he immediately begins to proclaim Christ. He immediately begins to, to reach out with the gospel that he once wanted to destroy. Reach out with the gospel. Number six, look out. Be on the lookout for needs to be met that aren't yours. Titus 3.14 says, let our people learn to devote themselves to good works so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. What do we like to do? You know, I'm going to put my needs in front of everyone so that they will see how much I need and that they will meet my need. And what we're supposed to do is devote ourselves to good works so we can help others in cases of urgent need. Now, that spurs one another on to love and good deeds. Look out to meet needs. And number seven, press on. Press on daily. Philippians 3.14 says, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. Forgetting the past and reaching forward to what lies ahead. And I press on towards the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's your perspective builder. And the more, by the way, the more you feast your soul on Christ in the word, the more like Christ you become. Feast on Christ. God reveals his glory in Christ. We are changed. We are transformed. We are growing in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what happens is we sometimes don't trust the process. We think we know better on the process and the timing and the orchestration and what have you. You need to trust God's process. He's got you on a process. Now, here's what often happens. We're on the process. We're, we're, we're trusting God, and we stumble and we fall. We bruise our knee. We skin our knee. We, you know, spiritually speaking. We, and then what happens is we get disillusioned with the Christian life. We start thinking, you know, something's gone terribly wrong. This thing isn't working because it's not working how you think it should work. There are three common errors I want to point out that we fall into and teach other people. The first is this. We think that heart change is optional or unnecessary. I can just say that I believe in Jesus. That's all that's needed. Well, no, there is no salvation without sanctification. You will not see the Lord without sanctification. That's what Hebrews 12, uh, 12 14 te uh, tells us. Was it Hebrews 12, 14? Is that right? I think it is. At judgment, Jesus is going to say to those who said they loved him but lived lives of blatant sin, what's he going to say? I never knew you. Depart from me. Now, your sanctification will not be perfect in this life, but it must be present in your life. Jesus said the evidence of salvation is you'll know them by their fruits. And justification and sanctification go together. This idea that you can trust Jesus as Savior without obeying him as Lord is unbiblical. A second problem error is we think that salvation excuse, is, is secured by our justification. We think that our sanctification, our growth, secures our acceptance with God, our, our justification. We are not saved by our works. We are saved for Good works. So Ephesians 2 tells us, for by grace we have been saved through faith. That not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one boasts. But in verse 10 it says, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. And another error is that we sometimes think that the Christian life was supposed to be easy or automatic. In J.I. Packer's 1973 book, Knowing God, there is a gem hidden at page 221. It is chapter 21. And he talks about a kind of ministry of the gospel that is actually cruel. He says that this kind of ministry goes wrong by giving inaccurate application of gospel truths and make people think that Christian living is a bed of roses or all pain. And the worst error is thinking that it's a bed of roses, with no thorns, of course. 
Packer says, false hopes are a greater evil than false fears. So for example, let's just say you think that the Christian life is all about suffering. God is going to, by his mercy, surprise you with the truth that life is also joyful, not all painful. But if you think that the Christian life is trouble-free, it is going to lead you to bitter disappointment. That's why it's cruel. Packer calls it irresponsible kindness. Someone comes to faith in Christ, they experience the new birth, they have new life, and they joyfully think they left all the headaches and all the heartaches behind. They're not going to bug them anymore. And what happens? You wake up the next day, and you still have personality disorders, and you still have tough relationships, and you still have unrealized, unmet desires, and you have nagging temptations that are still present in your life and sometimes get worse. Because sometimes life gets harder, even when you're following Christ. Because as you grow stronger and you can handle more, it's like God gives you a scholarship to a tougher school and exposes you to as much testing as you are able to bear, not more but not less. Through many tribulations, we shall enter the kingdom of God. And God builds your character and your faith and prepares you to help other people and grows your values and glorifies himself and his strength is made perfect in your weakness. That is the normal Christian life. Growing up is hard. You must press on. It's like like hiking uphill. But the Christian who was told they're never going to have trouble, now when they encounter hardship, They think they've gone outside the normal range. They search for something to make their faith work again. Well, this faith thing isn't working. My life isn't turning out the way I wanted. And Packer says a bondage is created. And it leads Christians to think their troubles are a sign of substandard Christianity. Well, I must have disobeyed in some way or stopped my moment-by-moment trust in Christ. And he says, the straitjacket remedy is you must maintain consecration and faith. You must stay fully surrendered all the time or else you are in trouble. And so people start thinking they need to find and confess and forsake whatever sin they committed to make their life bad and reconsecrate themselves to God and everything will go back to good. So actually... It's true if you grow careless toward God, if you start slipping into deliberate sin, your joy and your rest in Christ will grow cold. And you will need to repent and turn back to the Lord in trust and obedience. But what you realize as you follow Christ is, life is hard and it's not always my fault. Now most of us are like screaming so loud that it's not our fault that we don't even realize this truth. Life is hard and it isn't always our fault. It often is. But God wants you to grow in maturity. Think Job. Think the psalmists. Uh, Think those in Hebrews chapter 11. And what will happen is God will allow you to be exposed to attacks from the world, the flesh, and the devil to make you stronger and build your character. God disciplines every child whom he receives, Hebrews 12 tells us. Uh, The life of God invades your soul and a friendly takeover occurs. He possesses you. You are his forever. Uh, You are safe. You are secure. Uh, You can now live a life of self-forgetfulness. You couldn't before. And now you're free to serve God's glorious purposes in Christ. But when this happens to the person who was told their life would be on cloud nine or thought that, they're headed for a crash and burn. Packer says it sentences devoted Christians to a treadmill life of hunting daily for non-existent failures in consecration, and they stay in a state of spiritual babyhood. Because growing up in Christ is hard. And it is cruel to tell someone they should stay a baby in Christ. Babies are supposed to grow up. Packer says the least bad result is a childish, grinning, irresponsible, self-absorbed breed of evangelical adults. And the worst effects are morbid introspection, hysteria, mental breakdown, and loss of faith. That's what happens often when we misunderstand the Bible about growing in grace. We confuse the Christian life 
on earth with how it's going to be in heaven. We lose sight of God's grace. What you notice as, as you go deeper in God's grace is that he, through all your pain and all your hardship, is, is drawing you closer and closer to himself. And he doesn't shield you from pain and problems. He doesn't protect you from every circumstance. He exposes you to them and overwhelms you with a sense of your own inability so that you would trust him. I think we as parents and grandparents need to learn that. Not always shielding from pain and problems, not always protecting from every circumstance, but letting someone know that they have a sense of inability so that they would trust God more. And what God wants you to do is see Christ as your adequacy, see Christ as your sufficiency, and lead other people to think the same way, that this hard, joyful life is confusing, but we are to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. Jonah learned it from running and finding himself in the belly of a huge fish. Abraham learned it from losing patience and getting Ishmael. Moses learned it after killing an Egyptian. David learned it from stealing Bathsheba and killing Uriah's wife. Uh, excuse me, taking Uriah's life. Did you get that straight? <laughs> I didn't. David learned it from stealing Bathsheba and taking Uriah's life, taking her husband's life. The prodigal learned it lying face down in the mud. I don't know how you're learning it, but you have to learn it. And it's prepping you for glory. And it's only because of the life and work of Christ. I'll tell you a little story here. Uh, when we were uh, recently in, in Germany, in Munich, Germany, we were, this is back in January, and I got to witness firsthand the effects of disappointment and inconvenience and stress on a group of people bound for a common destination. So we're on one of the legs of a three-leg uh, flight journey to our mission trip on the island of Cyprus. The other two flights we were on were as polite and self-controlled as air traffic uh, and travel can be on a cold holiday weekend in, in Europe, okay? But not this flight. Here we were, we were, all, we were all lined up ready in the queue, ready to board our plane in Munich, Germany. And suddenly, seriously, with no warning and no announcements, our entire flight of 150 plus people are herded down four flights of stairs, out into the cold, it's like 30 degrees outside, and we get put into a bus, a couple buses, I guess, and drove us to a plane on the other side of the airport, and with no announcements. <laughs> Maybe they were in German, I just missed them, I don't know. Uh, but we get out there, and we get off the bus, and both gangways of the plane are, are open. The stairs are down. We're walking across, and the front and the back of the plane, and people are literally rushing off the bus to get to the plane. Mild chaos is ensuing. Uh, high levels of irritation. You could tell. You could cut the tension with a knife. And everyone is pushing their way through. And one man pushes one of our daughters out of the way. Another couple barges their way in front of Angela and I. And what happens is it takes a while for the people who entered at the back of the plane but had seats at the front of the plane to get through the big group of people in the narrow aisle and vice versa. And they have to navigate each other and people are just kind of going a little wacko. And here's men, women, and children all pushing their own way, going their own way. It was a free-for-all. Happy to tell you it all worked out in the end. We, everyone got situated, you know, everyone calmed down. Uh, settled in, and got to our destination, okay, obviously. So I tell you that story because I want to tell you about another free-for-all, okay, free-for-all. Even more messy and complicated, but the most ordered event in the universe because God is in control of it. People journeying to eternity, some to eternal life, blessed existence with God in heaven, some to eternal death, cursed existence apart from God in hell, Eternal life for all who believe, purchased with the blood of Christ. God showing his love towards undeserving of love. God saving sinners unable to save themselves. Free salvation for all who run for refuge to Christ, who rescues us from the wrath to come. And there you are on this journey. And you don't always like the arrangements or the orchestration of the trip. 
But it's not a free-for-all, actually. It can feel like one where everyone seems to be looking out for themselves and self-directing and fighting anyone in their way. And you realize you're learning obedience through the things you suffer. And it's prepping you for eternal glory beyond all comprehension. And, And the one thing I would tell you out of all that as you think about what happens when a heart changes and you think about, you know, how can I grow in grace? I would just say, Just relax. Calm down. God has everything in control, so you don't have to be in control. He knows, he sees, he does. So you can relax. You can do what you're called to do without straining and striving because he is all-knowing, he is all-present, he is all-powerful, and you can trust him. Things change when God changes a heart. Monumental change, freedom, growth, glory, a destination worth the wait. One day heaven. But until then, we suffer. And we experience joyful heart change as God uh, progressively grows us. Moms and dads need this. Sons and daughters need it. Everyone uh, born again by the Spirit of God will have it. And Lord, thank you that you are working in and through uh, the messiness of our lives, sometimes wayward, sometimes obedient. Lord, we know we're dependent on you. We are frail, we are faulty, but we, we want to follow you, Jesus. This is our life. We don't deserve the change you bring about. It is a gift of your grace. And so by your grace, we want to give ourselves more fully to you. And trust you to change our hearts. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.